We're now going to welcome Martin Lynch talking about how green was my tally, validating the proxies and predictions, predictions of a learning analytics service. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, when I uh, proposed the presentation months and months ago, I, um, I bit off more than I can chew. So I've had to overnight chuck about three quarters of my slides out. Uh, and I realize I've now got 15 minutes to get through this. So if you want a director's cut, then see me afterwards. So I'm going to basically unpack this, the background really quickly. I'm going to miss out a whole chunk and we'll get straight to the results, okay? So we're going to basically cover the background to what we're doing at the University of South Wales with the uh, JISC Learning Analytics implementation. Um, our early experiences with predictive analytics and the scourge of the black spot. Um, a basic overview, that's the bit I'm going to skip, of how predictive analytics works. And we'll get straight into the results of the validation exercise we've just carried out. And I say just, it's, it's, the slides came in last night. And what the results mean for us on this project. So a bit of background and context, University of South Wales, uh, one of the largest uh, universities in the region of, of, of South Wales, We've got four campuses. Um, our stats there, basically, the takeaway from this is that engagement and retention are big deals for us. Um, uh, if you look at the Polar 3 stats, that um, most of our, our, our students are from a low participation background. So we're very interested in engagement. We're very interested in supporting our students. Um, we have a very low tariff, but we have not bad retention rates, so we're trying to do some good work in that, that field. Um, we joined the JISC Effective Learning Analytics Programme back in March 2016. Show of hands, who else is in the JISC pro pro Programme? Very few, ones or twos, okay, okay. So it's taken us two years of preparation work to get to what we, it, we called the full service, which went into effect September last year. So we've only been operating a full year. Our primary focus for the work was really adding value to um, our as was then fledgling personal academic coaching program. Um, that had a couple of key objectives. The objective there was to present and provide with personal academic coaches with meaningful dashboards of data, engagement data largely, VLE, library, attendance, grade information, these would inform conversations with students. Um, I haven't got time to unpack uh, an impact assessment we're doing. Uh, the takeaway from that is it has made a difference. It has made a difference to our students and our PAC programme. Um, a secondary uh, expectation was that the data would be used to drive interventions, that our personal academic coaches would use uh, engagement data and the traffic lights that were implicit in that service to make interventions. This did not happen. I can tell you more about why that did not happen, but it did not happen um, for a number of key reasons, nothing to do with the data, but mostly to do with human systems. Um, a, a, a sort of also around program in here was just to explore the potential of predictive analytics, which, which was for all of us in the program quite an early um, offer. Um, the schema of what an analytics service looks like looks like something like this. At the bottom is all the data that we're collecting about our students. This is uh, the course level information, module level information, staff on a module, etc. So going from left to right. Um, then we've got all the stuff about the students, uh, the courses and modules they're enrolled on. And then we're moving into activity. So clicks, uh, visits, VLE, book borrowing, uh, we use the ALMA system. Uh, attendance monitoring. There's a veil of tear story about attendance monitoring, uh, which I won't get into. Um, coming next year, we do have Panopto sessions viewed, and quite excitingly, we've got electronic resources accessed through the library. This all gets sent up. This, the, 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 the critical thing here is that data has to conform to a, a data specification, the UDD. That's the master plan. If it's not in the UDD, it's not getting in. This is all sent up into the Learning Data Hub, and this is where the magic happens. This is where the learning analytics processor uh, does its stuff. Uh, the outputs are at the top layer. The most obvious for our staff is the staff dashboard. This is the descriptive data screen that the staff are accessing and viewing all that uh, good stuff for the students. The students themselves are getting an app. Uh, they're using that app to consume uh, a smaller subsection of the data, but they're also using that app to check into events 
attendance monitoring. Um, we've been cunning little foxes and we've now got our own way of drawing this data back in through a reporting service and adding stuff that we can't get into the UDD. That's data that we know is important, but it doesn't actually form part of the UDD. And we're going to be using that for an exciting next stage next year. And then if this was all working nicely, you'd have alerts and interventions coming out of it. That's the pr program. Okay. Now, we're in this for uh, another two years. Our license lasts until 2021. So this is one year out of three. So watch this space. Okay, the scourge of the black spot. Um, again, if you were part of the analytics program back in the early days, you'd have had to choose a data science partner. We chose Tribal and uh, their mature product student insight. Any student insight users here? Good because I can talk about what had happened for us. The problem with Student Insight is a very mature product, but the problem that we found was when we were looking at the screens it was presenting, and the screens it was presenting were showing a percentage likelihood of risk for the student. It was basing that uh, on quite a lot of personal characteristic data, parents' educational background, uh, their, their uh, highest uh, tariff on entry, this type of thing. Um, the black spot was coined because our uh, personal academic coach was saying to us, if a student comes to us with some of these characteristics and they have a bad prediction rating, I can't do anything about that. I can be aware of it, but it, it sets up a bad precedent. It gives them a, a black spot, as it were. But, so it goes against the ethos of the coaching model that was trying to be promoted there. So staff were really reluctant to engage with this. As it turned out, it was, also a, it was also very much about a data deficit model. It wasn't looking at the cohort or, 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 or of a course, but it was looking at an individual. Um, however, last summer, uh, the supplier at that point said, OK, if you want to continue on from this point, you're going to have to pay a license fee. Uh, we hadn't even validated the results. We weren't even sure about the results, but we were going to be expected to pay six figures. So we walked away. Well, in fact, we were chucked. Um, we were, we were essentially dropped as part of the partnership. So that left us working with JISC. Now, JISC, by this time, had selected a consortium led by consultants Unicom, Marist, uh, Unicom and Marist College. Now, the difference between the model that was uh, within this one was that it focused almost entirely on the descriptive data, on behavior and activities. The, uh, the uh, personal characteristics that were in there, but they're very minor, very background, no black spot. And the uh, model only starts to generate predictions when the activity data appears. So we were very happy with that. So um, and our, mature, our data was quite mature, so we were able to get our predictive analytics model working um, quite quickly. So we enabled that last September. So for a full year, I'm going to skip this whole section, how it works. You don't need to know about that. OK, rock curve for any of the data scientists, the results. So. What do we do? So we were capturing the predictions that were coming out of 61 courses. It's about 3,000 students. We chose those 61 courses because of their low, medium, and high retention rates. We were very interested to see if Predictor was any good at predicting risk, academic risk. What it was predicting, or set out to predict, or claimed to predict, was the uh, likelihood of a student not progressing on the course, deemed as an academic risk. Okay? So we'd already developed a method for anonymizing the data. So we could give it to an undergraduate. So we gave it to an MSc student. We created a research proposal. MSc student took it and ran with it. The challenge was take this data, take the actual results from these 61 courses, and compare the predicted result with the actual result. Not as a whole, but very interestingly, through the year. So at what point was this predictor any good, and for what reasons, and for what courses? In the literature, there's very few people of anybody doing this kind of thing about a timeliness, about when does this happen. So um, we wanted to know at a secondary level how the model performs over the course of the academic year. Yeah, okay, right. So we're attempting, what are we trying to do? Which we strategically, we want to intervene early and we want to intervene effectively. So we want an early indication of risk. Now, the JISC model differs slightly from what we might be looking at in that the JISC model is looking at the bottom 15%, the 15% of student average grades. Now, um, if anyone is familiar with the, the types of progression codes that you can get for a student, and we've got about 65, um, it's a moot point as to what categorizes success and failure. 
So is, is resitting uh, an assessment a risk? A lot of academics would say it probably is. Does the student see that as a risk, etc.? I've got five minutes, I'm going to crack on. I'm going to forget this precision versus recall, although it's an important concept. Right, the results. This is what you're all here for. So on the, on the left, you've got the students in our sample who we knew were actually at risk. And on the right, you've got the ones who were not at risk. In red, predictor predicted uh, those at risk. Now, you might think 75%, that's not bad. So if you were 75% uh, chance of being predicted uh, and then that just means that they were picked up in a predicting score once in the entire year so as a as a year set back that's not so bad unfortunately through the year it doesn't look so good it's probably easy to see it on a, this is a monthly view and this is on a weekly view this is the whole data set as, a, as you can see Kind of where you might want to see that there was a gap. Unfortunately, the predictor service stopped working for about seven weeks, which is why there's this gap of, in the middle. Right, so at the top, you've got this, this is reversing the, the graph. So at the top layer is the at risk, the known at risk, the bottom is the not at risk. Now, what we really want is the top layer to be all red and the bottom layer to be all blue. All red would mean we pre accurately predicted students who were actually at risk. So as you can see, it's not particularly effective and particularly when you might want it to be effective right at the start of the year, because then you can do an intervention. By the time it starts to improve, it's the end of the year. Not particularly helpful. However, that's not the whole story. For some courses, it's very good. Now, here's the BSc Computer Games Development course. And this, this is a very good graph, mostly red at the top, mostly blue at the bottom. And if you see the, uh, one of the first bar charts, that's about a 55%. It's even better on this one, which is the BSc Computer Science. This is our best performing example. So in this one, 75% of the students who actually failed were identified in that November uh, uh, data grab. And that's really exciting. So if we intervened using that data, we would have hit all the students who would have actually failed. That's a really good example. On the other side, unfortunately, we've got some very, very poor examples. Theatre and drama, it considered everybody to be at risk. Aeronautic engineering, nobody was at risk. Until the very end, when some people were at risk, well, they sat their exams, we knew they were at risk. Foundation degree and community, it was even worse. So what's going on here? Well, I'll tell you what we think is going on here is the the computing studies courses are the only ones that have got blanket coverage of, a, of attendance monitoring. So we've got a real problem in our institution of data gaps. And our, our attendance monitoring is a big problem for us and something we need to do a lot more work on. For that course and the way they teach it, attendance is critical. And they may put a big store in it. So surprise, surprise, the takeaway from this is where the data is good, the predictor works. Where you've got no data, it doesn't really work very well. So what? Uh, there's some graphs which can prove this. Uh, you can see that the ones in red are our best performance. This is a particularly interesting one. Um, clearly, the, the, uh, in, a, in a good performing course, it outperforms the average miles. So, et cetera, et cetera. So, the rock curve, anyone's familiar with rock curves, a receiver operating curve, that shows it, uh, it, it takes the false positives and the true negatives, puts them together. Uh, what you don't want is this graph. What this graph is showing is almost a straight line. That's, that's just better than guesswork. And that's in November. So in November, if you just got a monkey to chuck darts, you'd probably get as, as good as the predictor was doing. Um, however, uh, in June, it looks like that. Now, that's a good receiver operating curve. Okay. So preliminary conclusions from this. One minute. Perfect. Um, we do um, happily conclude that JISC is using robust methods and it's, it's predictive calculations. There's nothing technically wrong with what they're doing and it's been done well. Overall, the accuracy for our sample course is approximately 60%. Um, precision, uh, which is a concept of how, when it, was at, when it was predicting a student, how accurate was that prediction, it was only 25% accurate and didn't get up until 35% until the end of the year. Uh, recall, uh, which is how many of the students who actually were at risk did it capture, was 25%, didn't get much beyond 50%. Um, so for the majority, predictions are not useful until, until too late in the year. However, where the data is richer in certain courses, it performs much, much better. 
But given the overall performance of this, we are absolutely right in holding it back and putting it in a black box. Do not look at it and test it. So we did the right thing. Our next steps, now that we've got a method for examining individual course performance, now we've got to continue to investigate what is the data that's contributing to the highest performing courses and why, and what can we do about it? We're going to work with suppliers to understand the, this research, confirm the findings, particularly our, our two different definitions of risk. So is our definition of risk uh, different to the 15%? It turns out that it's, it's, they wouldn't have made much difference. So I think, we're, I think we, we, the conclusions are broadly uh, correct. We continue to collect data for our sample courses. And for those uh, courses where it is actually performing quite well, we're going to be carrying out a pilot where we're actually going to be using this data in anger with our uh, course teams to say, take action on this data because we can now be comfortable that in these courses, it, and for these reasons, it works. Whew. Director's cut later. Thank you, Martin, very much indeed. Um, uh, very well timed. We do have uh, about three minutes or so for questions. Um, if there are any in the audience. Yes, please. Yeah, second row from the front there. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt Offer from the uh, Adam Smith Business School. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the black spot. Is this a kind of machine learning problem where we pick up uh, a lot of stereotypes uh, due to bad data in the first place? I, I think it's the model that, that we, we're certainly seeing within the tribal model. So the tribal model was looking at outcomes and was looking at factors that lead to certain outcomes. And it was putting a lot of emphasis on background characteristics. So the, the, the kind of things that students couldn't change, where they're from, uh, their, their qualifications on entry, the way that they got here. Um, so it doesn't tell the same, the, the right story. What we liked about the, uh, the Unicom and Marist model was that it was, it, that, that stuff was okay at the start, but it was massively skewed by behavior. We don't care where you've come from, but it's what you're doing here that counts, the grades you're getting, your attendance, that type of thing. So that's why we were more ethically drawn to, to, to that model. Thank you. Um, Martin, we have a number of uh, questions on VVOX. I don't know if you want to uh, select any one of those in particular you'd like to respond to. Um, the first one right away, yes. I think there's a huge data literacy question about staff looking and understanding a dashboard. It's something that we're working through with our um, so we've only been doing this for a year for, with our personal academic coaches and it's something that we're constantly working uh, to improve with our staff training. So I think data literacy about graphs and how to read them for meaning is, is very important. Uh, is what is showing of course? Uh, I, I haven't got time to read that one, sorry. <laughs> um, no, the prediction algorithm is not created by core staff, that's created by JISC, uh, the supplier. Perception of the value of data and transparency and accuracy of the system. Um, students weren't seeing any of this data, and they weren't aware of it, and with no action was being taken on that on that data at all. So it was just sitting in a black box as an experiment. Um, Lots of questions coming in now. Yeah, um, I think yeah, we've, yeah. we've literally got one minute. So I think the question, the longer question, was um, uh, just uh, I think I'm um, pointing towards. Um, uh, courses with lots of coursework, checking points, opportunities for writing drafts. Um, do they give more possibilities to identify students at risk during it, the it's, year? It's, it's, okay, so the, the, it's all about the data. So the courses that are performing better seem to be where uh, we've got uh, coursework which is being graded early and put into the system. Quite often our courses might not put that grade information in the data system at all. It, they'll be using attendance data. They'll be using the VLE. So we've got a, a problem in our institution about lack of engagement with the VLE, so has everyone else. But our VLE rates are very low. But in, in courses where there is good use of it, you can actually use it as a metric for engagement. And it does seem to be meaningful. And there is a correlation with, with success. So I think um, that's a good question. But it's a lot about that activity turning into de actionable data that we can put into the, to the system. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Colleagues, apologies, because there's, there's still um, a number of questions coming in here. So it's provoked a lot of thought, um, which is fantastic. Um, however, it's now time to provoke a lot of lunch. So um, if we could just thank Martin and other speakers again.
Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.